Okay, I guess we can somewhat start since we said that we aim to start sharp. Uh, by the way, so, so some people mentioned me, me mentioned if there's any office hours, so maybe we can set up some time in case you're interested in talking to me. And so that would be Monday at five. And so that would be my office, which is VA 6206, or we can do it online or can do on Zoom. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll send you the link. Okay, very good. So, okay, so. So we can get started with the second class. So in fact, uh, first, before going into the random walks on groups with hyperbolic properties, that is, you know, the biggest part of the course, we'll still want to discuss the basic basic results in random walks that we discussed uh, yesterday. I mean, two two days ago, we just announced this is. A, probably the most famous result. So I feel like we should still uh, discuss its proof. So there's a famous theorem of Polia that says the simple random walk on ZD is recurrent if and only if D equals one or two. So once again, in low dimension, your walk will be recurrent. So we'll come back to the origin infinitely often with probability one. While if, if D is higher, somehow you have more space <laughs> to wander around and it turns out that this is enough for, for your walk to sort of diverge. Okay, so yeah, let's, let's discuss this proof. So this is sort of the more probabilistic proof that we're probably gonna see in this course because this, um, so, so first of all, let's let's recall. Let's see a, a, a criterion that we can use to determine whether a random walk is is recurrent. So, and the criterion is is the following. So we let so p n of x y to be just the probability that the walk goes from x to y in n steps. So this would be, according to our notation, the Wn equals y, given that W0 equals x. And if this is the case, then we define m to be the series, Pn from 0 to 0. So here we have a random walk on Zd, for instance. So we pick base point. And so this is the series, which could, you know, it could converge or could diverge. It's a series of positive and zero, I mean, non-negative numbers. And so the, the lemma is then the random walk is recurrent. Well, if and only if this series is diverged. So first of all, intuitively, this makes sense at least that this is the right direction because you see this being large means that you have a high probability of coming back. And so if you know if you sum all these probabilities, you get in infinity. And you know the, the, if, if this is infinite means this are large, it means that you have a high probability of coming back. So this is the intuition and uh, well this we can we can prove this lemma. It's, uh, it's not so hard. So, so uh, you can notice the, the uh, other fact is that, so first of all, M is intuitively is the average number of visits to zero. So why does it make sense to think that this is the average number of visits to zero? Well, because if you read this again, Right, so so what is Pn zero zero? Is the probability that time n 
is one such visit. <laughs> so for each k, pk0,0 zero, zero is the probability that time equals k is a visit. And so you're taking the sum of all those, and that's so that will be the expectation of the number of visits. So this is the intuition. And what what else do we need to, to show? Well, we, we, we can let u to be the probability that the walk returns to zero at all. So at least at least once. So you start your you have your walk on the grid. And you, you just take whatever the, the path is, but either it, it, it returns to zero or not. So let's call the probability that, that the walk returns to zero u. And then it's an exercise to, to write m as a function of u. So let's see, let's see why. So it's, it's, it's like this. So we note that the, the probability that the number of visits is less, is, is at least k. So what does it mean that the number of visits to zero is at least k? It means that the walk, first of all, comes back once. Now, if it comes back once, okay, probably the visits is at least one. Now, if you need at least two visits, you want to the walk to come back once and then come back again. And since this is a random walk, there is an independence of this return time. So, so there's a Markov property. And so basically the probability that the number of visits is at least k is u to the k. Because basically once you return once, you can kind of forget everything that happened in the past and you have to do it again. So, so you get u again, so it's multiplicative. So. Okay, and so now once we have this, then it's it's really clear how, how do we get m? Can we how do we write m as a function of, of u? Any takers, maybe? So m is the expectation of the number of visits, right? <laughs> expectation of the number of visits. So it's an integral. <laughs> And now the fa my favorite way to write an integral and many people's favorite way is the sum of the probabilities that the number that this variable is at least k so for each k. And, and, and so now we just uh, we just take this up. So this is just sum over u to the k. Yes, and then we, we can kind of see what happens. So the question is, is, is M infinite or not? And so, of course, so there are two different, so this is a geometric series. So of course, we would like to write this if U is less than one. And if U is equal to one, well, this diverges infinitely. So what we can say, we say that m equals infinity is if and only if u equals one. And what does it mean to u to be equal one? Well, it means that with probability one, the walk returns to zero at least once. So this already gives you sort of half the theorem because you see, if the random walk returns infinitely often, <laughs> then it returns at least once. So M has to be infinite. But then again, this is a random walk. So if it returns with probability one, at least once, then you can repeat the same, the same process. And the, 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 the second time also, the second return also happens with probability one. And so you have an intersection of sets of probability one, so it has probability one. So this is equivalent to say that with probability equals one, the walk returns infinitely often. Okay, so this is a, 
sort of a little kind of famous lemma in, in, in probability. Okay, so maybe are there, are there any questions about about this this lemma, this proof? Is it too fast? It's good. Yeah. So probably yeah. So okay. So and now what? And now we we just have to check in different cases when when you have this actually the D, we have to check whether this series is divergent or convergent. Okay. So, so now let's check. So let's do for d equals one, where we want to show that the sum of pn zero zero, well, this one want to show this is divergent because this would be equivalent to the random walk being recurrent. And now fortunately in, in one dimension, we can do the calculation can do a little bit of combinatorics. In one dimension, it's fairly easy. Combinatorics. So if this is zero, so again, it's simple random walk. So we go right or left with probability one half. So what's the probability that you're coming back to zero after n steps? Can we write combinatorial formula for that? Does anybody, I mean, some of you have probably seen it before. So what? Yeah, that's a good point. So it's zero if n is odd, because every time you have to go either right or left, and the number of rights has to be equal to the number of lefts. Right, so if n is even, what do we have to do? Well, again, we have to choose the right and left, right, left, left, right, something like this. And we want to say that the number of rights is the same as the number of lefts, which has to be n over two, because you have n steps in total. And so, as you said, like the, you, you're gonna get t, you're gonna get n, choose n over two. And then, well, the, 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 so this is the number of possible configurations, because you have to choose n over two out of this n. And then the num and then the denominator is two to the minus n. And now we just need to play a little bit with this and and see estimate this binomial coefficient, which you know is n factorial divided by n over two factorial squared. Two to the minus n. And how do we estimate binomial coefficient? Factorial? Yeah, so there's a good old Stirling's formula. Because there are various more and more refined ways, but n factorial is basically what? It's n over e to the n, I think. Then there's another small factor, which is square root of n, I think. <laughs> I, let me check with, yeah. Yeah, and there's also two pi. If you really want, you, you can say it's like that. But okay, I, I, in fact, to, to determine the rate of growth, it doesn't matter the, the, the two pi, so let's forget about that. And it's kind of nice this exercise because if not, if you've never seen it, like it's like you, you n over e to the n times square root of n, and in the denominator you get n over two, so n over two e over n to the n over two to the square root of n squared, and then you see how this two to the minus n. Right, and and then let's see what happens. Yeah, so sorry, squared. Sorry, is n? Yeah, so there's this square here. Yeah, exactly. So if you if you work this out, did I make a mistake? 
Yeah, but it's the same rate to square the one. So I, 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 I'm forgetting the constants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you're right, of course. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. So, so what happens? So you have n to the n, square root of n, e to the n. This is the this thing. And then here, what do we have? Well, there is this square here, right? So in the denominator, you have, again, n to the n. Then you have 2e to the n. So you have 2 to the n, e to the n, square root of n squared, so it's n. And then you have 2 to the n. So there is a lot of simplification. Like that. And so it's like 1 over square root of 1. Yeah, when I put double uh, squiggle means I'm forgetting the multiplicative constant. If I put only one squiggle, I have to be more precise, so I don't need it. OK, so so far so good, because of course, this implies the square root that, that this guy is of the same rate as this one, which is infinite. So somehow the returns to, to zero in the, in the line are polynomial, are some power of n. But this power, you see, is, yeah, it's somehow is small enough so that if you do one over it, it's, it's big enough that it diverges. OK, so that's a sort of standard exercise. Now, what about if we go to higher? What about if we go to higher uh, dimensions? So for d equals 2. Huh? Now we have square grid. In many ways, even more classical. OK, and, and we have four options to move. So we have, let's call it traditionally north-south, east and west. The hardest part is to remember which side, is, where is east and where is west. I think that is that right. Yes. <laughs> North and south, uh, everybody knows, but east and west is, is a mess. Well, okay. So, so now again, it's the same thing. So if if n is odd, clearly there is no return to zero because you you have to, you know, take uh, the same number of norths as south and the same number of east and, and west. So we have to check what is p two to the n. Zero, zero. P two n. Okay. Now I'm sure there are many ways of doing this. So the thing is, yeah. So so what's that? What's the my favorite way of doing this? The the, the there is a bit of a trick here for for two dimensions, and the trick for two dimensions is that you can reduce to the one dimensional case in the following way so we can we can we, we have to we have four targets so we we need to go in these four places with the same so we have you know the famous coin that has four sides but can we toss two coins instead and and the answer is yes how do you how can you toss two coins <laughs> to represent this, these four choices? So here's the trick. So you look at this walk. You, you, instead of going north, south, east, and west, you can go first, you toss a coin, and you decide if you go northeast or southwest. And then you toss a second coin, and you decide if you go Northwest or southeast, and of course, if you did, if you started with here, from if the first move was here, then the second one is like this. We don't have a Pokemon to show this, but we can imagine Slowpoke that goes around. Yes, so so you see, this is a. <laughs> Kind of interesting trick in the sense that you 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 can decompose with with this walk in two dimensions in in two orthogonal one dimensional walks because again 
every time to, to go back to zero, you still need the same, you still need that the number of green arrows that goes in the northeast direction is the same as the number of green arrows that goes in the southwest direction and in the northwest and southeast. So, so how do we, so, so how do we uh, determine this, um, this probability then? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's just the square of the previous one, basically. Yeah. So because again, the this is the probability that the number of northwest choices equals the number of southeast choices, and the number of northeast choices equals the number of southwest choices. But these two things are, are completely independent of each other. So. So we are in actually in a, in, a, in a pretty good situation. So this is just a probability that, uh, you know, for instance, the number of Northeast equals the number of Southwest square. So this is the trick that you can split it into two independent ones. And so, and so this is like one over square root of N, which was the one for, for one dimension square. And so, so clearly this is one over n. And so again, the sum of Pn zero, zero diverges because each of them grows like one over n. So, so far so good. Now we can kind of guess maybe what happens next. <laughs> because in one dimension, the, the probability grows like one over square root of n in two dimension goes like one over n. And what about in three dimensions? What, what do you think? Yeah, that's exactly right. So in fact, so the fact is that we cannot, we're not going to prove it in, in, general, in the, the whole generality, but we will give, a, we will prove something in dimension three. But in general, it's true that in, if, yeah, on, on, on ZD, the probability of 2n coming back to zero after n steps, this is of the order of one over n to ID over two. Clearly, this would be enough because the fact uh, the, the fact, of course, would imply the theorem because, of course, if you take the sum of p two n, and of course, if n is odd, it's still zero. So, so this would be sum of one over n d over two, and so of course, so this would be exactly infinite if d equals one or two and finite if d is at least three. However, so this is all true. There is, however, a sort of problem in a sense that the computation becomes way trickier if, you, if you're in higher dimension. So in one dimension, we can just do the binomial. In two dimension, we reduced the, the two-dimensional case to product of one-dimensional cases. Now, the question is, uh, how, how do we reason for, what about d equals three? So here you would have a three-dimensional grid. So, okay, now already it's complicated to draw. <laughs> Start with a grid like this, you have a cubical, cubical grid sorts, right? Something. Something like that. Really. Quite tricky to draw. Can we go green? <laughs> it's 
something like this. And so, so you have how, how many directions do you have here? Yeah, we have six directions. You have north and south again. You have again east and west. And then you, you have one more direction, which is which is uh, let, let's call it in, inward in, inside the board and outward towards the outside of the board. Okay. Now here's a question. Can we see, can we interpret a, this random walk in, in, a, in a three dimensional grid as the product of independent one dimensional walks? Let's think about it. So how many how many options do we have here, right? Yeah, here you have six options. And what if I do three three independent one dimensional uh, walks? That's yeah, that's more or less the the, the fact, right? So because you see. If you if you think about it, so suppose you do a walk in 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 the three directions. Suppose I do three three walks. So one is up or down, one is uh, left or right, and the other one is in or out. So maybe you get something like this. So, you know, if you if you consider all the possible options, you would have eight options, and in fact, what what you can see geometrically this will bring you to the eight vertices of the cube. So, so if you do it, you know, you, you can do up or down and left or right, and then in and out. This these options will get will get you to the eight vertices of the cube, which is not what we're trying to do here. Here we want to go to the faces. So we have, you know, we, we choose what it's like choosing one face. So somehow, so why is it easier in one dimension, in two dimension rather instead of three dimension? Well, if you think about it, what we did here is like we have a square. And so we have the, the, the faces of the square, so the sides, which are the original one. And we consider the, the dual. So that if we do the walk here, we do the walk in the in the dual tessellation. So now the dual to, to square is still square. Okay, not the one I drew. <laughs> right? So if you think about it, if you do if you do like that, you still you still have square. So but if you if you look at the cubical lattice, what's the dual to the cubical lattice? It's an octahedral lattice. <laughs> so if you do so, so it's not it's it, 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 this. There is no self duality in 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 higher dimension, and this is more or less the reason why it's it's not completely trivial to compute to compute this. No. But we can still at least estimate it. So this will be the sort of last combinatorial problem in this whole course, I think. So, so how do we estimate it, right? So what do we, so again, we need to compute P2 and 0, 0. So what do we have? We have these three types of, of letters, right? So, so we have N, uh, we have two N, two N such positions, and we have to fill them with what? With S and W, or I and O, or E, sorry, S and N, and E and W. And what's the constraint that we want? We want that the number of S equals the number of N, the number of I equals the number of O, 
and the number of E equals the number of W. Of course, in total, it's 2N. So another thing that comes from here is that the number of S plus number of I plus number of E has to be N, right? Uh -huh. so, so can we write this as a, as a binomial or tr trinomial coefficient <laughs> here? <laughs> Any any brave person who wants to write this? What do we need to do to count this? Yeah, it's a sum, right? It's not going to be just one thing, but basically, what what do we have to do? So, okay. Well, first of all, you have the six to the minus two. Uh, no, this is just the denominator. Right, so, so let's go K, the number of, you know, S's that you put, for instance. And then J. And then, of course, so the next one will be just N minus K minus J. Right? Okay. So yeah, so we, so we have to choose k and j. So it's like k. You have to sum over k and j's between say zero and n, and maybe that k plus j is less than. Right? And now suppose we know k and j. Then it's a bit easier, because we have to put. We have to choose. Right, so 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 we have to choose the 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 positions where we where we put the s, and then we have to choose the the other positions and so forth. Right. So if you do this, so the solution turns out to be like this. So you you have two n choose n, and then you have n factorial divided by a factorial j factorial n minus k minus j factorial squared. So let's see. Let's see what kind of uh, what kind of choosing are we doing here? So first of all we have to choose n over 2n, right? So first of all we choose so we, we divide this into the sort of the left, left labels as I or E and the right type of labels, right? So we have to choose N out of the two N that will be labeled uh, either as I or E. Okay, and now once, we, once you have that, out of those, we have to choose, right, we have to choose K of them out of the N that will be labeled S. So this would be n choose k if you really want it like write it like this. And then how many are we left with? Where well, we have n minus k left, and we have to choose j of them. Now, if you do this computation, <laughs> you realize that this is literally this thing here. Because it's n factorial, k factorial, then you have n minus k factorial here that simplifies with n minus k factorial. And you're left with j factorial and n minus k minus j. Okay, and then you have to do the same. So first of all, so again, so first of all, you you pick this. Uh, let's pick this 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 white white labels. So let's say we have four, like something like this. This would be the white ones. And then once you once you pick the white ones, you have the other ones are are from the other row. And so there's n of them, and then of those, and this is this choice. And then once you have that, you, you write this. And it's twice because you have to do it one for the left column and one for the right column. OK, so we wrote a formula. And now what we would like to say and uh, that this is roughly 1 over n to the 3 halves. OK. A bit tricky, 
but at least if I want a, a bound one way, it, it's not that enormously hard. So, so suppose that we want to show that the Randall walk is, is transient, so it means that this series is convergent, so you just have you just need an upper bound. And the upper bound is easier. Why is the upper bound easier? Well, if you look at this coefficient here, this is like a trinomial coefficient, right? So it's like you have A plus B plus C to the N. <laughs> and you're looking at a coefficient for K for A to the K, B to the J, C to the N, it's K minus J. And so trinomial coefficients are like binomial coefficients. If you look at all of them with fixed n, which is the biggest one? The middle one is the biggest. So, so you, we can say that whatever this number he, here is, if we take k, j, and n minus k minus j to be the same, so they're all equal n over 3, this is the, the, the biggest one. So we get the following. So this is s six to the minus to the minus n to n over n, and then we still have this the sum over k and j plus j minus n, and then we have the following: we we replace this by n n over three cube. Where? Okay. And and then we have to estimate. So the, okay, this one does not depend on K and J. So we can put the K and J here. K plus J is less than N and these are positive. It's like one. So what is this sum? No, no, no. So it's a trinomial coefficient. So oh, if you do one plus one plus one to the n, because you're summing over all possible options. So it's like that. Okay, and so so we're we're in good shape now because we we reduce ourselves to this well not so great looking, but but in fact it's not uh, super complicated. Three factorial six <laughs> to the three. Yeah. And now again, you, you have to write down the Sterling formula once again. I think maybe <laughs> maybe we don't. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't need to do it. But uh, yeah. So basically, in the end, you just you just you just write the, the Sterling formula once again, and indeed this gives you one over n to the three halves. You see that the there's a power of three in the denominator, which I think with the square root of n in the Stirling formula would, would, would give rise to this. Okay, so yeah, this is a bit of a computation, which you may or may not enjoy, depending on what you, what you like in math, but uh, at least that, well, it's, it's, it's still doable. Now, as the dimension goes up, things get uh, more complicated, but okay, more or less, I think this type of bound would still work. The, the lower bound, uh, well, is, 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 is trickier. Yes. Okay, so that, that, so that shows that the random walk, the simple random walk on Z cube is transient at least. And so remember, so so remember, remark that we discussed last time is that on on Z D, let's say on Z cube, the random walk, the simple random walk is transient. But the drift of the walk, so the speed, is still zero. So it is going to infinity in a way but it's doing so very slowly. 
and uh, so it's very different different from from let's say from the simple run walk on the four valent tree for instance where l is positive as we discussed last night because when l is positive then the walk also is transient that's a, a stronger okay are there any questions Okay, so so now we we start with a chapter in actual ergodic theory, which will we will give some uh, basic yeah basic facts about ergodic theory that are we we will use a lot in our next uh, next work, and in fact at this point. The difference between ergodic theory and, and, and probability in, in many ways is that in ergodic theory, you really cannot say, cannot estimate things precisely by doing some computation like this, by estimating the, doing the analysis and computing the coefficients, but it's more about things that happen almost surely or, you know, with, on a set of full measures. So these are sets that maybe we cannot really control very well uh, explicitly like effectively but we still we give we give this this sort of statements yes on b2 yeah so so in z2 like you yeah. get this so, so you can think of part like the graph you drew is just a kitty graph the standard mirror like, yeah if you pick a different finite mirror like that for 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 z2 yeah uh, do we know anything about if, if it's still recurrent or not yeah, of course, uh, there is another option. So it depends whether the bar center of of the walk, you see. So of course, you could say, okay, I go up with probability, you know, two thirds, and I go down with probability one third. And, uh, and I can even make it so that, okay, two, two over six, maybe one over six, and then you still go one half and one, one quarter and one. <laughs> Yeah, but what does it mean to do uniformly, right? So the issue is depends on what is the body center of the measure. So if the weights in all directions cancel each other, then it's still recurring, and the drift is zero. Otherwise, the drift will be pointing. You know, the the, the net <laughs> drift will point in some direction, and then it will be non-zero, and then of course it will be trans. So in in uh, yeah in in uh, in Z two is 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 somewhat somewhat easy to control because uh, somehow again you can still in these are in abelian groups you can you still have this sort of you can sort of decompose the walk still in in different components yeah okay good other questions yeah okay so so what is the main um, object of study in ergodic theory well. So the idea of, of ergodic theory is studying systems that evolve over time and from a probabilistic or measure theoretic point of view. So typically the, the main object is a, is a measure preserving system. And so what is a measure preserving system? Well, we start with the space, so that we, maybe we call X. And it has a measure, let's say, mu or p, depending. Maybe we can call it p, since it's, it's mostly going to be probability for us. So, if, and of course, so secretly there is a sigma algebra that. <laughs> so this is a would be a measure space. And in fact, most of the time we will assume that p of x equals one. So this would be also called the probability space, but. For several theorems in ergodic theory, this is not needed, but I think in this class it will always be the case. And of course, so A would be sigma algebra and P would be a measure on this sigma algebra. And well, often we will not mention the sigma algebra, so it will mostly be the Borel sigma algebra when you start with, say, metric space. Okay, and then we have a, a point, we have a map. P from X to X, 
measurable map. So what does measurable means? Means that for every A in the sigma algebra, the inverse of A is also in the sigma algebra. So remember, very, very important fact in, in, uh, all, in algebraic theory, like you pull back sets. You, you, you very rarely say something about the image of a set, but most often you look at the free image. And we'll see, we'll see in a second why. And, and, so, and so measure, but it has to be measure preserving. What does measure preserving means? Means that so we say that P preserves probability P if the probability of the inverse of A equals the probability of A for every A. And of course, there's also another way to denote this, which is, we, so you see, we pull back sets, but we push forward measures. So, so the notation usually is that the push forward measure T star P, this is the push forward measure. Well, it's nothing else that T star P of A is probability of T inverse A. So sometimes I will write the parentheses and then I will forget about it. So. <laughs> Will give me some time. I already know that. So some people just don't put them at all. So, and then what's the third object that people look at in ergodic theory? Well, so you look at functions, and so you're probing your your system. So you see, an intuition would be something like x is no, X is the, the universe, <laughs> for instance. And, and T is the map that goes from the state of the universe today to the state of the universe tomorrow. And we can ask questions about what is the probability that something happens today versus what's the probability that something happens tomorrow. So measure preserving system means that for every possible event that you have, like, you know, the probability that today drains is the same as the probability that tomorrow drains. Of course, uh, the system has to be sort of pretty big for that, for that to be true. Like, but may, I, so of course, uh, depends on how, 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 how big is the system, maybe over the, all planet Earth, maybe it's kind of correct. I don't know, but anyways, this is the this is the meaning of, of such thing. And then the, the last thing is observables. So how do we probe our system? Well, an observable is just a function. It's just it's just the function is a measurable function. f from x to r. So again, measurable means that the pre-image of every Borel set in r is in the sigma algebra. And so again, what is the what, what, what this means? For instance, the usual example would be like the temperature. <laughs> so f measures the temperatures today. And then so we can we can study the composition of F and T. So for instance, if you look at F composed with T, this means like you take the universe, you look at tomorrow, and then you measure the temperature. So F composed with T would be the temperature of T. So, so a corollary of the definition is that if, and here usually we can, we can write the whole thing X, A, P, T is MPS, which is measure preserving system. Then 
Well, the integral of f composed with t in dp equals the integral of f dp over the set for any f, yeah, for any f measurable. Well, an integral mode, so of course, yeah, so for instance, for instance, we could say f is in L1. That would be one way to us to ensure that the integrals are uh, defined everywhere. As long as any this makes sense, uh, yeah. If f is positive and uh, and this integral is infinite, then this also is going to be infinite. So that's also true. Sorry, is this a question? Or... Yes. Yeah, uh, no. 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 No, definition, I've given the definition of measure preserving means that the push forward of the measure under T is the same as P, right? So, yeah, so, and uh, this is a corollary. Is a corollary is that the integral of every observable when you compose the T is the same as the integral of F. So again, if your system is measure preserving, so it's stationary under time evolution. The average temperature on the globe today equals the average temperature on the globe tomorrow. So this is the average and of, of this function f that you that you're using to probe. Of course a very important important example which is where this sort of duality between functions and sets comes in is that you can say, you can pick F to be the characteristic function of a set B. So B is measurable. So instead of measuring saying the temperature, I can say, you know, B is the set of days where it's sunny. <laughs> you know, is it, so this function is zero if it's not sunny and one if it's, so, and so why so this so why is this example important? Because it it ties the discussion between measures and, and sets. Because f the f composed with t. So if you start with characteristic function on set B and you compose with t, this is nothing else than the characteristic function of the pre-image of B. I mean, this is more or less. Yeah, this is a <laughs> extremely extremely easy to see, right? Because you know why one b composed with t x equals one if and only if well t of x belongs to b, which is of course if and only if x belongs to the inverse b. So we we probe so. So in particular, in particular, so so measure if 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 you start with measure preserving system satisfies that the integral over x of one b for the t dp equals the integral over x of one b dp, <laughs> right? And in fact, <laughs> if you write this down, what this is, is the, you know, this is the integral of characteristic function of the inverse of B. So this is just the probability of the inverse of B. And on that side, this is just probability of B. <laughs> so, so we go back to the definition of measure percent. So we can, yeah, yeah. so using functions, instead of just sets is a bit of an you know ex extension but remember the fundamental before we now we, we can finish but let me just say the the fundamental principle is the following that for for set the way you the so for a set a the way you act by the dynamics is t inverse of a for a function you the way you act is f composed with t so you act like that, and and for a measure p, the way you act is push forward the measure. 
So this is the natural way to look uh, to look at things, even though yeah, they, they all in, they all inter interplay with each other very nicely. Okay, very good. So I think it's time to stop. But uh, yeah, next week we will see uh, more about ergodic theory and prove maybe one or two of the famous ergodic theorems. Any questions? Yeah. She used like computer preserving. Yeah. Means like uh, so the put forward measure is yeah. just a. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we will see some examples because it's a slightly counter distracted to taking the pre images. It's maybe slightly counter to. For instance, the doubling map on the circle, the map X goes to 2X mod 1, <laughs> is measure preserving with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Because it has two pre images. So every set, so this map expands the measure by two. But if you take a set, there are two pre-images. And both pre-images have, have size a half of the original one, and you sum all together. Which lemma? The lemma that says that equivalent look at the sum of P and 0, 0. Mm -hmm. I mean, if bigger than P, you pull out the value back, that's where no, no, no. Wait. So, so the lemma is independent of the space you you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. The question is how do you how do you check that the sum is how do you check that the sum is is finite or infinite? Right, so uh, tiruses are recurrence. So now we, we, we said this. So so it's this so m equals infinity is equivalent to u equals one. So we prove this. Yeah, u is a probability of returning to zero. So right, yeah. So so that's this uh, yeah, so this was the yeah, this is the proof of the lemma, but we did we did prove it. Like, yeah, because m is the sum of u to the k. This is true where either in either case. Yeah, so we did this proof. <laughs> so just look again on the proof. I, I think we did all the, all the details there, but if there's something missing, let me know. But I, I think we did. Yeah. But. No, it was always you. Maybe it was not written well. But oh. <laughs> it's all meant to be. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Okay, Hi, professor. so I'll see you next week. Hi, Professor. Hey, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just have a question. Uh, so for the Poirier's theorem, if you want to prove it for uh, uh, works with finite variance, uh, what, what are the other methods that you would use? Yeah, let me, let me try. Yeah, you're, you're... Yeah, the audio is not. It's, I think the volume is just too high. So, can, can you speak again? Let me let me try to go a little. Yeah, can you hear me now? I think it's a bit better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering uh, if you want to prove Fourier theorem for the works with say finite variance. Uh, what are the other methods that you you would use? If you want to prove Pauli theorem for finite for works. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. more general works. Yeah, 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 yeah. Honestly, I'm not. I, 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 I I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't, I, I haven't looked at this proof in, 
in detail. But I, I can, I, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, honestly, I don't know at this point. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no worries.